For those of you who are taking communicative abilities in English 2, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about the problem statement. And I'm referring to this assignment that we have due that relates to our second essay that we're currently working on. I went and uh, graded all of the assignments that were submitted in, uh, in Canvas, looking specifically at what you have in your Word document. So I would go in and I would look at uh, that you posted something in the Canvas platform under this assignment and then go directly into the Word document, leave comments based on what I saw there in your Word document, then I would assign a grade. If you have three possible points, I'm basically looking to see that there are three, basically three sections or elements or aspects to your problem statement. Remember that a problem statement begins with a topic, which is more general followed by an indirect question that needs to be more specific using key terms that we talked about in class, finding the appropriate combination of those key terms, okay, to help us make the indirect question more specific. And then finally, we concluded with a significance. Now, the significance directly relates to the purpose and the target audience, okay? So don't be confused with the idea of creating a problem statement and thinking that the indirect question relates to the problem because in this essay, we're going to develop what's called a problem and solution essay. So this indirect question, that second aspect of your problem statement needs to reflect a possible solution. The significance needs to either implicitly or explicitly directly relate to the problem, the problem, the purpose, the target audience, those three aspects are very much related. Are you trying to persuade maybe or offer assistance to novice teachers to give, to offer them new teaching techniques that might help them motivate students, English language learners to use better grammar when speaking? Now notice I used a combination of key terms in that example to help narrow down perhaps a more appropriate topic for a five paragraph essay. Most of my feedback that I am providing and leaving in the Word document relates to the indirect question, that second element, looking for the right or the appropriate combination of key terms that we talked about in class. Remember, listening, speaking, reading, writing, grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, interactional patterns, critical thinking, materials, didactic materials, technologies, and even some of those terms by themselves might not be specific enough. For example, technologies. Maybe you classify a or you categorize a type of technology that is more appropriate for your five paragraph essay. For example, social media. Social media is a type of technology, but maybe we don't even mention the word technologies, but we say instead social media. If you find a lot of articles on a specific type of technology, for example, what's up, then you can use that term throughout your essay. It just depends on how specific. Of course, we can be too specific, but I would say 90% of my feedback or higher, maybe even a higher percentage, uh, is trying to provide you some ideas about how you can be more specific. That really is the most difficult thing when writing a five paragraph essay not trying to do too much, not trying to have a topic that's just too general and that having a, a negative effect on your final essay. So this is what I want us to focus on when we're submitting this assignment, okay? So if you're submitting a thesis statement, honestly, in this assignment, I'm only looking at the problem statement. Some of you have included indirect and direct questions. Today, I wanna to provide an example. I wanna walk you through an example of taking a problem statement that is specific enough and taking you through the process of developing direct and indirect questions. And uh, today we won't talk much about a thesis statement. I, I really want us to get our heads around a specific problem statement, how to look at it, how to include those three elements of a problem statement, and then recognizing, grammatically speaking, recognizing the indirect question and the direct question. The whole purpose here, guys, is when we're developing an essay, we're simply answering a central question, one question. 
And this is very important going through this process so that as you are writing your essay, you continue to go back to that question and ask yourself, okay, what is my central question? Am I staying on point? Am I getting off topic, for example? Okay, because once we develop that central question, that direct question, then we can think seriously about the thesis statement because the thesis statement simply answers that one central direct question. And then we can talk later about developing a thesis statement with three key points at the end that are more specific and later we'll develop into topic sentences that we will then later look at in terms of body paragraphs and how we can even be more specific. So just to give you an overview, this is where we're at when we start this writing process, when we begin the essay, trying to get our heads around this problem statement. And in terms of our your second uh, assignment, the skeleton outline, I think I'm going to wait since I've been out of the office. I'll probably wait until you're well into your your essay before we take a, another look at the skeleton outline. So the the idea here probably will be to put aside the skeleton outline until you uh, have developed the essay. Okay, um, you know it depends on in terms of the the assignment. Okay, I think it's still important to try to develop the skeleton outline before you develop the the body paragraphs. But I, I because of the time, I want us to get right into developing your essay, regardless of where you are in your writing process. I want everyone though to take another look at your problem statement, take a look at your grade first of all, and in many cases resubmit so that you're making an effort trying to narrow down your topic, okay? Because again, this is going to influence the rest of your your writing. All right, so let's take a look here. I I've added some comments. I made a video yesterday and uploaded and I want to continue adding five more points to our list of uh, feedback points that, that I want to address. I want to add a second video to the same space, all right, so that we can take another look here at the problem statement and give you basically five things to consider. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the five points and then we'll look at an example and, and come back to these five points so that I can um, try to provide some examples, some concrete examples of what I mean when, I, when we look at these five different points. Okay, so the, the first point, make sure to include the following three elements when drafting a problem statement. So remember that a problem statement has three aspects. It begins with a topic followed by an indirect question. And then it concludes with the significance. As I mentioned before, we're writing a problem and solution essay. The problem is going to be developed in the introduction paragraph, and the rest of the essay really is essentially talking about a problem. Uh, I'm sorry, a possible solution. So again, the problem in the in, is occurring in the uh, in the in introduction paragraph. This is where you're going to develop the the what, the how, the why, the when, the where, as it relates to the problem. And the solution is going to be reflected in the thesis statement and subsequently in the three body paragraphs. So when we're talking about the problem statement and we're looking at the indirect question, that second element of your problem statement, the indirect question needs to relate to a possible solution. Some of the feedback that I provided when I read the indirect question, I feel like we're you're talking more about the problem. So take a look at your indirect question and you ask yourself, does this question, this indirect question, reflect a problem or a solution? And then make sure that it reflects a possible solution. Now, there are cases where the topic, that how you begin your problem statement, it reflects more of a problem. And I, I'm not really making many comments to most of your uh, topics, as, as you've stated in the problem statement, as long as it relates to the indirect question or vice versa. The indirect question comes directly or relates somehow to the topic. So as long as there is a relationship between 
the topic, if you wrote it as a problem and the indirect question is a possible solution, that's fine. If you have a topic that relates more to a possible solution, that's also acceptable, that's fine. Again, as long as there's a direct relationship between the indirect question and the topic. Remember the indirect question. Now, this is the hard part. How do we make this indirect question specific? The topic is general. The indirect question should be specific. And I think one of the easiest ways I feel to kind of brainstorm and think about how we can narrow down our indirect question is refer to the list that we talked about in class. We created a list in class, one of the last classes we had before I, uh, before I uh, left. We talked about finding the appropriate combination of key terms that we could include in the indirect question to help make our ideas more specific. For example, our list, can, our list included terms like listening and speaking, reading, writing, grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation, prosody. It could even be phonology, phonetics, right? We didn't talk about that in class, but those are all related. Those are key terms maybe that you could include. What else? Didactic materials, technologies. Now with technologies, you might think, well, technologies is a general term. And yes, in fact, it, it is. So maybe you focus instead on a particular type of technology, for example, social media. If you happen to find a lot of articles, let's say on Facebook groups, let's say there are many articles on using Facebook to promote some aspect of English, the English language learning classroom, for example, speaking, writing, critical thinking, maybe some kind of social aspect to learning, say let's let's say a peer assessment, working together in peers or in small groups. So notice that I'm combining Facebook with let's say interactional patterns or peer work, autonomous learning might be another key term. But I'm trying to find the right combination of those key terms that I could bring into my indirect question so that I could have at the end here a, a, a question that I could answer in the, in the form of a thesis statement that is specific enough for a five paragraph essay. All right, so again, the process I feel is to first refer to the list. As you're reading the articles, these other additional key terms are gonna pop up, right? It, they can't not pop up. You're gonna be reading different articles and you're gonna find articles on Facebook. You might find articles on WhatsApp. You might find articles on interactional patterns in the English language classroom. I mean, it, there are many different types of articles out there. So it's just a matter of as you're reading, being very selective and choosing in the moment as you're scanning and skimming these articles, not reading the entire article, but just looking maybe at the abstract first, maybe even just the title first and saying, okay, this, this might be a possibility and this, and put it into this pile, right? And you start to categorize and find these appropriate combinations of terms that are relevant, that you find interesting that relates to what you want to write about, but at the end of the day, you have articles to support those ideas. So remember, reading is very much part of this process. It's one thing to, in the abstract, come up with an indirect question, finding appropriate terms, and then later find out, well, maybe you can't find certain articles. So again, reading and making these decisions, going back and forth, I think is the best approach. So the third aspect, in order to, and then the significance. Now the significance, some of my feedback that I've been leaving you in your Word documents relates to making sure that you also include a purpose. If you use the template, and I'm encouraging everyone to use the boilerplate or the template to begin your, your writing process for this second essay, just exactly like what we did in the first essay, you'll notice at the bottom of the title page two lines, one line that reads target audience and the second line that reads purpose. So who's your target audience and what's the purpose? What are you trying to achieve by writing your essay? What do you want out of this? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to convince or persuade a particular group of people? And the key term here is a particular group of people. 
when you write out a target audience as let's say students and teachers, my immediate response is, well, which one is the target audience? The key word here is target. Now there might be, you know, your essay might be relevant and to uh, various degrees, it might be important for teachers and students and parents and administrators. But the key point here is who is the target audience? Who is the primary group of people that would get the most having read your essay? And you should be very selective and say, okay, these are the, this is who I'm going to start with. If I'm going to give my essay to someone, who would I start with? Who should I give it to first? for them, you know, to, to see how I feel about a particular point and they would get the most out of your, your essay. So when you're thinking about your significance, you have to combine the problem, the purpose and the target audience in how you're drafting and how you're choosing the words that you want to include following the prompt in order to. So for the purposes of this assignment, I'm going to ask that we all follow the same prompt. I wish to learn more about, and then you insert your topic. Followed by the prompt, because I want to know, and then you choose one key question word. Maybe it's a how word, how question word, why, when, or where. These are the four that, that stand out as probably being the best choices. The best choice is probably being how or why, but maybe you have a when, maybe you have a where, but you do not have a what question. In fact, I don't think I saw any uh, additional question words uh, out there. We don't want a, a which question or what question for, for this indirect question. Okay. Now remember that just because you're choosing one central question word at this point in our writing process doesn't mean that when you get into developing later on your body paragraphs that you're ignoring the other question words. Of course, you can talk about the what, the how, the why, the when, the where when you get into the details of your body paragraphs. Okay, that's a different situation. We're still at the level of trying to find a way to <clears throat> narrow down our topic in a way that is appropriate enough for a five paragraph essay. Okay. Because if we aren't careful at this point and we start too general, then our body paragraphs are going to be too general and it's going to be harder to stay on point. It's not, it's going to be less clear what our thesis is, our main point. What are we trying to do with this essay? It just gets, it gets kind of uh, messy very quickly. If we're not careful at this point, starting out, trying to be more specific. All right. So this is the first point. We'll look at an example here in a second. Point number two, how can I narrow down my indirect question in my problem statement? We've talked a little bit about this already. In fact, uh, I'm not going to touch on this again, but I've actually included the list as best as, uh, as best as I can recall, based on what we talked about in class. And I have added some additional terms as well as I remember it, but the idea is to find the combination of terms that I've listed here. There might be some other terms that I haven't listed. Do you have to include all of these terms? Of course not. It's finding the right appropriate number. How many do we need to include? I don't know. Two to four, I'm thinking maybe as a, as a general rule, but it really depends on what words you're, you're choosing, right? Because some of these words are more general than others. And again, as I mentioned before, maybe technologies, I, I want to provide you this idea in the abstract, but, you know, maybe technologies itself is too general. Maybe you think about, you know, um, artificial intelligence or um, social media, as I mentioned before. Maybe you want to focus specifically on a wiki or a blog or podcasting. Okay, so again... Find different concepts, find the combination to help you narrow down your indirect uh, question. Point number three, make sure that your indirect question focuses on a possible solution. I mentioned this before, okay? Make sure that your essay is a problem and solution because our thesis statement needs to focus on a possible solution. 
The thesis statement answers the direct question. So the direct question needs to focus on a possible solution. The direct question comes from the indirect question. The indirect question comes directly word for word from the problem statement, if you want to think of it backwards. But that's the relationship here between moving from the problem statement to the thesis statement. Point number four. The indirect question that relates to your essay comes directly from your problem statement. Okay, I'm kind of thinking out loud and then reading this, but I'm repeating myself. The direct question of your essay comes directly from the indirect question. Okay, so I just mentioned that. Okay, point number five, when writing the significant section, your problem statement, consider the purpose of your essay and target audience. Again, I think I've already mentioned this. So these are the five points that I'd like for you to think about and reflect on as you're looking at your current version of your problem statement. All right, so when I was looking at your work, there were a few that were okay. I did leave some comments, but make sure that you're considering my feedback that I'm leaving in, the, in your Word document uh, before you move on, okay? And if you aren't sure if by my language, by my feedback, or even by the grade, if you need to redo it. Certainly, if you don't get full credit for the assignment, the expectation is that you are going to make some modifications and resubmit. Okay, so I have no problem changing your grade, but I would ask that this happen um, by, by Thursday of this week. Today is May 22nd, it's Sunday, and I'm going to ask that all changes or all resubmissions to this assignment uh, be made by Thursday, May 26th. All right, so let's take a look at an example, and I hope this will provide some context and maybe clarify some of these points here that we have, that I've included here and that we've talked about in class. So I'm gonna take an example here, and this has been, this is a student example. It's a good example. Um, I'm going to kind of think out loud, look at this example, make some suggestions, not necessarily that these need to be made, but I do want to just provide you some, hopefully some insights, some perspective here when I look at this example and what I'm thinking about when I'm looking at this example. Okay, so here we have the problem statement, the indirect question, the direct question, and the thesis statement. I'm gonna spend most of my time here today with this example thinking about the problem statement and these questions We'll talk very briefly about the thesis statement because I feel like that is a separate discussion. Uh, but I do want you to find the relationship or recognize the relationship between these four aspects. Okay, so let's take a look at the problem statement. So here we have our prompt. I wish to learn more about. All right, so here's our prompt. And then we have our topic, students lack of motivation when learning uh, learning English. So this is our topic. Now, uh, it's general enough. I feel like there's really not much to say in terms of this topic, but notice that it doesn't have to be much. Students lack of motivation. This is the topic. Now, in this particular case, in this example, we're reflecting some kind of problem and that's okay. It could even be simpler. It could be something like, I wish to learn more about motivation in the English language learning classroom. Just motivation in the English language learning classroom. And I'm not really focusing on a particular problem. I mean, I'm not mentioning specifically a problem. I'm just saying motivation. Now we can we can infer, we can think, well, okay, maybe there's a lack of motivation, but you know, for the purposes of writing this problem statement, it's not necessary. And we'll talk more about why it's not all that necessary at this point here in a few minutes. So we have a good topic here. Now, the next part of our prompt begins with the word, because I want to find out now, this is our prompt. Now, in this particular example, we're using the question word how. In your example, you might have a question word why or where or when. You probably should not have the question word which or why. We want open questions, right? Because later on, this is we're setting up 
our indirect question, right? We're actually beginning now the indirect question that relates to our five paragraph essay. So here we have, because I want to find out how English teachers encourage implicit or promote implicit learning of grammar in poorly motivated students by doing drills. All right, so some good things about this indirect question that makes it more specific. And I'm going to I'm going to color code, I think, some of the key terms. I'm, again, I'm looking for a combination of key terms that helps us make our indirect question more specific. So here we have English language teachers. So let's let's highlight this bad boy. All right? So automatically here we're focusing on teaching. All right, so this might also infer later teaching techniques, but for now, certainly we're focusing more at this point on teaching te uh, teaching techniques. And we have implicit learning of grammar. Now, it's not just implicit learning. So there's a combination here of implicit learning, that's one key term, and then grammar. In fact, let me separate these two. Why not? Even though this is kind of a noun phrase, let's separate this. So we have implicit learning as one key term. We have another key term of grammar because we could focus on implicit learning of when speaking, right, to promote the speaking skill. We could talk about implicit learning for, uh, for vocabulary development, implicit learning of pronunciation, right? There are many choices available to us when we're thinking about implicit learning. Notice that there's no mention of explicit learning. Now, in the essay, maybe there's a, a, a chance or a need to compare and contrast implicit, explicit, but the key point here throughout the essay is implicit learning. So that's fine. We don't need to mention both. You're choosing one over the other, and in this indirect question, in this case, we're going to focus on implicit learning. Now we have grammar now, poorly motivated students. Now, this is another key term that's listed here. I guess my question would be, is it necessary since we've already mentioned motivation up here? And so I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing to say uh, or include. My question is, is it really necessary? And I feel like it's optional, okay? It's, if, you, if they include it, if the student includes it, that's fine. But notice here, it's, it's almost, well, it, it's, it's indicating the problem. And I think one of the reasons why I'm inclined to want to ignore this prepositional phrase in poorly motivated students is because it's getting us back to the problem when we probably want to focus more on a, a possible solution. So here we have English language teachers should encourage or promote implicit learning. Again, I, I, I'm i thinking promote but uh, or encourage implicit learning of grammar by doing drills. Here's another key aspect. All right, so these combination of terms, English teachers or even implied teaching techniques, there's a kind of an implication there that might be, uh, that should be considered. We have implicit learning, we have grammar, we have doing drills. All right, so the whole essay should be related to these combination of key terms. There's one, two, three, four key terms in this example. How many key terms do you need? I don't know. Depends on the terms themselves. There might be cases where two is enough, but it totally depends on how specific those terms are. But this is a good example of here we have a good a combination, I feel, of key terms. Now, the assumption is that the student in developing these four key terms in the problem statement, uh, the assumption here is that th these decisions were based on articles that the student has already read. That is, there have been articles from peer-reviewed journal articles that support, that mention, or research implicit learning, 
grammar, doing drills in some way. Now, does this mean necessarily that every article has to mention all of these? Does this mean that every single article that the, that the student uses to support their ideas needs to mention implicit learning and grammar and doing drills, and it needs to focus on teaching techniques to make that happen? Not necessarily. Now, maybe there are some that can be used, but it doesn't necessarily mean that every single article needs to have all of those key terms. The, the job of the writer is to find articles that relate to doing drills in some way, that there's some articles related to teaching techniques that are linked to doing grammar or implicit learning or doing drills. Your, your job as the writer is to find those articles to make those connections so that you support later on your thesis statement, okay? Because all of the things, all the decisions we're making here at this point later are gonna be reflected in your thesis statement. All right, so we've got now our indirect question. Let's move on now to the significance. Now here's our prompt. Now in this example, our prompt, uh, the, the, the writer is using the prompt in order four. You might also have in order two. I think actually the, the example that we talked about in class was in order two. But you could also say in order four or in order two. Okay, but this is the prompt that's going to set up the significance. Now, here's our significance. ESL teachers, uh, for te EFL teachers to know different ways uh, in which in which low motivated students are incited to learn um, the English grammar classroom. So, the the significance here is maybe it's relevant to teachers, EFL teachers or ESL teachers, if we want to make the distinction uh, between EFL and ESL, but certainly language or teachers or teachers who are teaching English as an additional language, okay, to, to help students be more communicative. Like maybe the problem here is that students are not using the language. Now, this may or may not be appropriate depending on what the point here is, especially when we're talking about drill and practice. So this whole essay is going to be not about the communicative approach, but drill and practice. And that's fine. Many people are against drill and practice. Many people are against a more traditional approach. So choosing those topics and making an argument for a certain level of value of drill and practice is certainly a very uh, good approach, okay? Your job is to argue against because some may say, no, drill and practice should never be used. Traditional approach should never be used. It's never appropriate. So in this case, the job of the writer is to make an argument for using the drill and practice. Now, maybe this doesn't mean that the writer is suggesting that 100% of instruction is related to drill and practice, but certainly... The, the point, as I understand, as I read this problem statement, the point is going, going to be that there is a space, there is a place, there's a time and place for using drills to promote implicit grammar in the English language classroom. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with that. Go with that idea. Go with that mindset. But think of the significance. Think of the, the purpose, the target audience, and the problem. This problem statement, right, should the problem should be reflected in the problem statement. Now, the problem statement starts here with I and it ends here with the very last word. This is one sentence, and this is why you don't necessarily need, in fact, in our case, we don't want to mention the problem in the indirect question. The problem should be more reflected in the significance. Again, the significance should be very much related to the target audience the purpose and the problem so that your topic and your indirect question, you have kind of a, a reason for even stating the problem and uh, I mean the topic and the indirect question. You have a purpose, you have a reason for doing that and that reason, that purpose should be reflected here. All right, so in this particular example, I would probably articulate it slightly different thinking of 
and and probably not using again the word motivation, but simply trying to persuade or or to assist, let's say, new or novice English language teachers, or maybe it's teachers who have um, who have large groups that they are trying to find ways to help students learn implicitly in the classroom. Okay, maybe it's for children. You know, think of think of the problem. Where is this the biggest problem? Remember that in the introduction paragraph, you're going to develop the problem. You're going to talk about what the problem is and why and where and how. So think, think about the problem that you're going to develop in the introduction paragraph to provide context for what you talk about here in your, um, in your significance section of your problem statement. Hopefully this makes sense. Uh, this is what, what I'm thinking about here uh, when I'm looking at this example of the problem statement, and uh, this very much relates to this point number one, looking at the three sections, making sure that we have three points, three parts of our problem statement, and also making sure that the indirect question relates to a possible solution and that it's specific enough, okay? So it's really a combination of points number one and two as I mentioned here, and point number three, making sure that the indirect question relates to a possible solution. Now, let's take, take it one more step and look at the indirect question and the direct question. So let's assume, just for the sake of this example, we'll leave this indirect question as it is here. So here's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to begin. I want to find out. So my indirect question is going to begin with the pronoun I. And it's going to conclude with the word drill. So I'm just going to copy and paste this into my document here. And let's compare these two. I want to find out how English teachers should encourage the implicit learning of grammar in poorly motivated students by doing drills. Here is my indirect question. All I did was copy and paste. It's word for word whatever I have here. Now, if I'm making suggestions in your Word document as to maybe uh, modifying this indirect question, then the idea would be first to modify it in your problem statement here and then copy and paste it down to your indirect question listed below. I would list out this assignment. When I'm thinking of this exercise, I'm thinking about the problem statement first and then below that the indirect question, copy and paste, and then converting it to the direct question and then the thesis. I'm thinking top to bottom in this order. So once you have your indirect question, now we're going to convert the indirect question from the, to the direct question. Now I'm asking you to do this more as a grammar exercise to see if we can grammatically construct a, an indirect question. We can recognize it as being an indirect question and then converting that to a direct question. So when we're direct, when we're making this conversion, we can exclude the prompt that begins with, I want to find out. And we can start with the question word. So remember a direct question, a content question like this, an open question. We Start with a question word followed by the subject. So when we're looking at it grammatically speaking, we're converting the indirect question to the direct question. We begin with the question word, how. Now the, this example, of course, this is, we're talking about a content question. So yes or no questions are slightly different <clears throat> grammatically speaking, but here we're going to be <clears throat> considering a content question or an open question. So we have a question word followed by an auxiliary, an auxiliary verb, or a modal verb, but an auxiliary verb 
followed by the subject of the sentence. Okay, this could be a, this is our, our subject, in this case, English teachers is our subject. And then we have, in this case, encourage. And we'll say here, lexical verb or main verb. This is our main verb or lexical verb that completes the verb phrase should encourage. Okay, so when we're writing a direct question, this is the reason I'm asking for you to look and, uh, and actually compare these two is so that you can see, grammatically speaking, or in terms of syntax, how we organize the, the order of the words, what the difference between these two are, the indirect question versus the direct question. So here we have, how should English teachers encourage the implicit learning of grammar and poorly motivated students by doing drills. So this exercise is to see if you can word for word replicate or convert the indirect question to the direct question. No notice that I'm including all of the exact same words in both versions of these questions, the only difference being the order. And of course, I'm ignoring this prompt, the first part of the prompt here. I'm, I'm just leaving that out. So you can leave that out. Right, but starting here, how teachers should, right, and so on, encourage. This is what I'm converting, and this is what I would look at. Take a look at your own example and check your grammar. Check that you are, number one, including word for word, copying and pasting directly what you have here in the problem statement. And then number two, you're properly converting the indirect question to the direct question. Now, of course, as I mentioned before, if you still are making changes to the problem statement, you know, it doesn't make sense to, to change this yet, all right? Make your final modifications first to your problem statement and then make the changes to the direct and indirect question. Now, uh, just to show you the relationship between the thesis statement and the questions and the problem statement, the thesis statement should directly answer the direct question. It should explicitly answer this question. Now the thesis statement, as we talked about in class, has five elements, has five sections. So it's going to begin with some kind of transition. Here's a transition. And then here we have the subject, English language teachers. So how should English language teachers encourage the implicit learning of grammar and poorly motivated students by doing drills? English language teachers should encourage the learning of grammar. So here's what I, I would do. <clears throat> I would say something like, English language teachers should encourage the implicit learning of grammar in poorly motivated students by doing drills by, and then in this case, by li then listing out the three points. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, this sounds a little bit awkward having by twice, and I would agree. So what I would suggest is to the, what I would suggest to the, the writer here is to find a way, let's go all, all the way back now to the problem statement. I would include this term, doing drills, but find a way to include it somewhere else in the indirect question without the prepositional phrase by doing drills. So that you could follow this same idea. Notice here that the thesis statement that I've stated here, I'm starting with the subject. Forget the, of course we need a transition. Okay, but after the transition, start with the topic and then the verb phrase. Remember the verb phrase is the main claim. This is your point of view, your main point that you're trying to make for your essay. So I would say English language teachers, and I'm using exactly the same words here in the direct question. English language teachers should encourage, should encourage the implicit learning of grammar through or by, I wouldn't say by, maybe through doing drills even that sounds a little bit, you're saying through and then by. Um, 
let's say English language teachers can use, now I'm going to modify slightly the thesis statement, but this would imply changes to the direct and indirect and the problem statement have to work all the way back here. But saying something like English language teachers should use drill and practice or can use drill and practice exercises to promote implicit learning of grammar by, and then eliciting participation, and then listing out the three key points. Okay, so notice what I'm doing here. And this is just a suggestion, but notice how, <clears throat> and this is a good example. I'm glad we're showing this because <clears throat> notice that it took us all the way to the thesis statement to realize, hey, well, maybe we can modify slightly the wording so that in this case, we're not using by twice but we're still reflecting exactly word for word whatever we need to from our questions, our direct and indirect questions in the problem statement. All right, so for um, that's what I would suggest here, slightly modifying. You're saying the same thing, but it's modifying the thesis statement and then looking at the impact it's going to have on everything else coming before it, the direct question, the indirect question, and the problem statement. All right, guys, so I hope this helps. And again, really, we want to make this what I, I refer to this as kind of tightening up our writing. That is, in these four aspects, the problem statement, indirect question, direct question, and thesis statement, we're essentially using the same words. We're just changing it a little bit. Now, in our thesis statement, of course, we're going to have added our three key points. This is a good example because we have, we're using commas to separate the, the points. But I think by going through this, you can see now the relationship between these aspects. Uh, one other thing I'll mention about the, the key points, looking as you look at your own thesis statement, your key points could be listed out as phrases, probably not individual words, although, I mean, you could, but it's probably not recommended for our purposes. So either phrases or clauses. All right, so you could have phrases listed out, three phrases or three clauses that represent the three points that later will be developed in greater detail in the form of topic sentences. So eliciting the participation of students, practicing interactional patterns, and using social media. Notice here the use of parallelism, maintaining the same grammatical structure for each of these phrases. These are um, these are uh, phrases that are being used here. Okay. All right. So I hope this helps, guys. Uh, take this into consideration when you are making changes. Those of you who uh, want to resubmit the assignment, uh, I hope this helps this, this example. I'll be online this week uh, fielding any questions that you have. If you want me to take a look at your problem statement once you've made those changes, uh, let me know. Send me a message in, uh, my, in uh, Microsoft Teams chat. And um, in fact, uh, let me back up. It's not necessary to send me a notification. If you resubmit the assignment in Canvas, I will get a notification. So I'm going to be checking periodically for those notifications. And when I see those notifications in Canvas, I'll go directly into that. So it's not necessary, you know, that, uh, that you uh, send me a message unless you have a question, of course. If you have something that uh, either we need to discuss or if you have a question that you want me to leave, maybe a, a comment in your Word document, that's a different situation. By all means, send me a chat in uh, Teams. Okay. All right, guys. I uh, hope this helps and we'll talk to you soon.